Part 1 The Five Harps An ionospheric heater is an array of antennas which are used for heating the ionosphere and which can create artificial aurora. There are five facilities currently capable of acting as ionospheric heaters. The first is the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, operated by the United States. The telescope has three radar transmitters with effective isotropic radiated powers of 20 terawatts at 2,380 MHz, 2.5 terawatts pulse peak at 430 MHz, and 300 megawatts at 47 megahertz. The European Incoherent Scatter Scientific Association, or ISCAT for short, operates an ionospheric heating facility capable of transmitting over 1 gigawatt effective radiated power, ERP, near Tromso in Norway. It operates three incoherent scatter radar systems at 224 MHz, 931 MHz in northern Scandinavia, and one at 500 MHz on Svalbard. Russia has the Sura Ionospheric Heating Facility in Vasilsursk near Nizhny Novgorod capable of transmitting 190 megawatts ERP from 4.5 to 9.3 megahertz. The facility consists of three 250 kilowatt broadcasting transmitters and a 144 crossed dipole antenna array with dimensions of 300 meters by 300 meters. At the middle of the operating frequency range 4.5 to 9.3 megahertz, a maximum zenith gain of about 260 is reached. HAPAS High Pass Observatory, capable of generating 70 megawatts ERP at either 2.85 megahertz or 4.53 megahertz is northeast of Fairbanks, Alaska and operated by the UCLA Plasma Physics Laboratory. The fifth is HARP, producing 4 gigawatts ERP north of Gekona, Alaska. HARP is an ionospheric research program jointly funded by the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the University of Alaska, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. The most prominent instrument at the HARP station is the Ionospheric Research Instrument, IRI, a high-power radio frequency transmitter facility operating in the high-frequency HF band. The IRI is used to temporarily excite a limited area of the ionosphere. Other instruments such as a VHF and a UHF radar, a flux gate magnometer, a digisond and an induction magnometer are used to study the physical processes that occur in the excited region. Part 2 Harp's Prehistory most believe that, although admittedly inspired by the wireless power transmission patents of Nikola Tesla, the original designs for any kind of atmospheric heating device do not date back any earlier than January 10, 1985, with patent number 4,686,605. Applied for by Spring, Texas inventor Bernard J. Eastland. Thus, in discussing HARP, it is usually the Eastland patents 
that are considered first. But the prehistory of modern ionospheric heaters begins with the United States Central Intelligence Agency, U.S. CIA, developing a program called MKUltra to find a reliable truth serum that could replace the placebo sodium pentothal. MKUltra tested a variety of chemicals on unknowing subjects in mental asylums, prisons, the armed forces, and eventually even students on U.S. college campuses. It was at that point that one of MKUltra's test chemicals, LSD-25, became the dominantly popular drug in the U.S. youth culture. However, by the so-called Summer of Love in 1967, the Soviet equivalent of the U.S. CIA, the KGB, had long been developing its own equivalent programs to the CIA's MKUltra. Behind the Iron Curtain, research into the field that the CIA had long dubbed MK for mind control was conducted as experiments testing for parapsychological abilities such as extrasensory perception, ESP, telekinesis, TK, pyrokinesis, PK, clairvoyance, prophecy, etc. This field has since been dubbed Psi Research. Nina Kulogina displayed remarkable psychic abilities, including telekinesis and psychokinesis. In 1968, her films were shown at the first Moscow International Conference on Parapsychology. In this footage, she appears to be moving metal objects solely by moving her hands above them. This effect, if real, is clearly magnetic in nature and, as we see here, can result in wild rotation of a compass needle. Contemporary to their research into psi and related phenomenon, the Soviet Russians were also testing over the horizon OTH, radar systems using enormous antennae arrays. The first experimental system, Duga-1, was built outside Mykolaiv in Ukraine, successfully detecting rocket launchers from Baikonur Cosmodrome at 2,500 kilometers. This was followed by the prototype Duga-2, built on the same site, which was able to track launches from the Far East and submarines in the Pacific Ocean as the missiles flew toward Novozaya Zemlya. Both of these radar systems were aimed east and were fairly low power, but with the concept proven work began on an operational system. The Duga-3 systems used a transmitter and receiver separated by about 60 kilometers. The Duga-3 array went online around July 1976. The result was the worldwide Russian woodpecker radio signal. The woodpecker signal had an interpulse period of about 90 milliseconds a frequency range of 7 to 19 megahertz, a bandwidth of 0.02 to 0.8 megahertz, and typical transmission time of 7 minutes. The signal was observed using three repetition rates, 10 hertz, 16 hertz, and 20 hertz. The most common rate was 10 hertz, while the 16 hertz and 20 hertz modes were rather rare. The pulses transmitted had a wide bandwidth, typically 40 kilohertz. This signal was continually broadcast until December 1989. According to some reports, the Komsomolsk na MRA installation in Siberia was taken off combat alert duty in November 1989. The original Duga-3 site lies within the 30-kilometer zone of alienation around the Chernobyl power plant, 
which suffered a nuclear reactor core meltdown on April 26, 1986. The woodpecker signal was considered aggressive by U.S. and NATO during the Cold War because it bordered on interference with worldwide radio transmissions. Part 3. The Ionosphere To begin, we will be looking at a certain portion of the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. On this chart we see Y-class, called gamma radiation at the top, is extremely high frequency, extremely short wavelength radiation, with high energy. Gamma rays are capable of dissociation of atomic nuclei, meaning a laser of this kind of radiation would fire a beam that could split an atom and ignite a nuclear fission reaction alike an atomic bomb. Below gamma rays are X-rays, and below X-rays ultraviolet light. At the level of ultraviolet radiation is where we see the photoelectric effect occurring, with photons being absorbed and re-emitted by electrons, resulting in the wavelengths of the next level lower on the scale of radiation by energy levels, the visible spectrum. Below the frequency per wavelength of visible light rays, we encounter infrared radiation, and below this, of slower frequency and longer wavelength, is radio wave radiation. Radio waves result in effect of physics called plasma oscillation inside metal antennae. Radio wave frequencies range from 3000 gigahertz to 3 hertz and are of special importance to human sciences because only radiation below 300 gigahertz remains trapped inside our atmosphere, held there by a layer of ionized plasma called the ionosphere at a height of about 50 to 1,000 kilometers above sea level. The ionosphere is formed as solar radiation, photons, combined with the gases of the uppermost atmosphere to form an ionized plasma. An ionized plasma is, basically, a gas cloud that has an electrical charge and can thus be influenced by magnetic fields. The ionization of this cloud is what results in the opacity of the atmosphere to slower frequency, longer wavelength radio wavelengths, causing them to become trapped within Earth's geomagnetic field. In short, the ionosphere allows only certain spectrums of biological, non-harmful radiation to reach Earth, as well as prevents a certain amount of magnetically affected radiation from leaving. Although the F1 layer of the ionosphere, responsible for radio wave refraction, is present both day and night, because most of the ionization of atmospheric gases in the ionospheric plasma occurs as a result of solar radiation, the lower D and E layers are most active on Earth's daylight side. The diurnally affected side of Earth's ionosphere has an equatorial trough around 20 degrees of the magnetic equator, where the F layer sinks downward and compressing the E layer 100 to 130 kilometers altitude, thus causes a concurrent equatorial fountain effect past 20 degrees from the magnetic equator as the ions are caught into Earth's east to west rotating magnetic field. Within 3 degrees of the magnetic equator, the ions are propelled the fastest, and this effect is called the equatorial electrojet stream. Part 4. Controlling the Ionosphere The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, HARP, facility houses many diagnostic instruments for studying the ionosphere but the highlight is the HF transmitter array. This array consists of 15 by 12 
crossed dipole antennas, which together can transmit a total of 3,600 kilowatts of RF power at frequencies from 2.8 to 10 megahertz high frequency range. HARP is located in a region where large natural currents, known as the auroral electrojet, flow through the ionosphere. By turning the HF array on and off, i.e. modulating the HF power at ELF frequencies, we can also modulate the conductivity of the ionosphere at those frequencies. When combined with the electric field that drives the auroral electrojet, the result is a current that oscillates and thus radiates at the modulation frequency, an ELF antenna in the ionosphere. These signals can then be detected with nearby receivers shown in the map. Although for many years the U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. DOD, suppressed the fact the HARP antenna array was based directly on the Eastland patents and thus could indeed accomplish the entire set of uses he intended for his Tesla-esque invention. This image from the Stanford University VLF Studies Group page on its experiments using the HARP array is lifted directly from the original design plans. The diagram shows how ELF waves are injected into the magnetosphere, follow field-aligned ducts, interact with particles, and are received at the conjugate point, exactly as Bernard Eastland had patented. From Eastland's 1987 patent, numbered 4,686,605, entitled Method and Apparatus for Altering a Region in the Earth's Atmosphere, Ionosphere, and or Magnetosphere, in Figure 4 we see quite clearly the ionospheric heating method used for lifting or lowering a selected portion of the Earth's magnetic ionosphere by applying ELF radio waves to plasma to create a field-aligned Berkeleyland current. This diagram from the Stanford VLF Group's HARP Experiments page shows the beam behavior for classic amplitude modulation and new geometric modulation techniques and exemplifies the level and degree of control capable now for using ionospheric heaters on the atmosphere immediately above their locations. At the magnetospheric conjugate point in the southern hemisphere that received the original broadcasts through the ionosphere of the pulsed harp signals, occasional repeats of their original broadcast remain detectable. The reflection of these signals back from the conjugate point to the HARP array's Alaska sensors creates an echo in the pulse rate of the signal that lags by about 8 seconds. The signal repetitively cycles between the broadcast array and the targeted conjugate point without weakening and even appears to be, to quote the Stanford Study Group, evidence of non-linear amplification of the wave in the magnetosphere. The cause for this is called remnant magnetism. The same effect can occur from a bolt of lightning striking a spot on the soil with any metallic ore in it. Remnant magnetism can also occur along a magnetic field in the Earth's ionosphere and the result is to reduce resistance and induce capacitance of a projected ELF wave. Eastland had anticipated the ability to create what the Stanford group call an ELF antenna in the atmosphere using these repeating pulse signals, which the Stanford group call one hops for the signal itself and two hops for the repeating echo effect. 
in his much more ambitious patent from August 13, 1991, called Method for Producing a Shell of Relativistic Particles at an Altitude Above Earth's Surface, Eastland unveiled the full scope of what his ionospheric heaters were capable of. He proposed using these machines to establish total human control over the planet's electromagnetic field and the creation of a layer of relativistic particles which the U.S. DOD saw as potentially useful in creating a missile defense shield surrounding the entire planet Earth. The only problem is that there are unpredictable results that can arise from such a plan. The first side effect of the HARP array's earliest broadcast signals was, obviously, the unintended discovery of the two-hop repeating echo as the signal bounced back from the targeted conjugation point due to remnant magnetism. To illustrate the unintended danger of even this already accomplished effect, we turn to the study of brainwave entrainment, where we find the origins for the use of various types of tonal pulses of audible sound to affect alteration to one's natural brainwave rhythms. The goal of brainwave entrainment is to induce a scalar wave scattering field condition of consciousness by combining one's own brainwave rhythms with a counterpoint pulse sequence of audible sound. This is accomplished by overlapping isochronic tones, evenly spaced pulses of the same pitch, and monaural beats, that is, two pulsed sound waves of the same amplitude, volume, but of different pitches, tones. The result of their combination is an effect called binaural beats, which are the subsonic difference between two tones close in frequency, pulsed at a regular or offset rhythm. The binaural beat produced by harp would be represented by the 8 second gap between the 1 hop signal pulse and the 2 hop delayed echo. Part 5. Brain Waves Brain waves are the levels and patterns of pulsed electrochemical activity inside a brain as measured currently using electroencephalograms, EEGs. Because EEGs do not measure very deeply into the brain, the inner cortex brain wave activities remain relatively unmapped. However, there are now classified four brain wave states associated with higher cognitive reasoning in the outer cortex tissues and one related to the longer, slower wave patterns controlling autonomic function. The delta brain wave pattern originates as high amplitude waves in the frontal lobes of adults, posteriorly in children, and represents deep, slow wave sleep. It occurs on the radio wave spectrum at up to 4 Hz frequency. The theta brain wave pattern appears to relate to the inhibition of active response such that it spikes in situations where a person is trying to repress some thought. It occurs as low as 4 but always less than 8 hertz. The mu brain wave pattern originates in the somatosensory cortex and represents the resting state of motor neurons. It occurs between 8 and 13 hertz. The alpha brain wave pattern varies in amplitude between hemispheres, but originates in the posterior rear regions of the brain. It corresponds to the brain wave states observed in coma patients and occurs between 8 and 13 hertz. The beta brain wave pattern produces low amplitude waves observed predominantly in the frontal lobes occurring symmetrically between the left and right hemispheres. This brain wave state is associated with an active waking state 
and measures radio wave frequencies in our brains that occur between 13 and 30 hertz. The gamma brainwave pattern originates in the somatosensory cortex and occurs in conditions where a subject is using cross-modal sensory processing or combining multiple sensory centers. It has the highest radio wave frequency from between 30 to over 100 hertz. The purpose of combining isochronic tones and monaural beats to form binaural beats out of the subsonic gaps between the pulse rhythms is, when applied to brainwave entrainment, to cause an existent brainwave state to be altered into a different brainwave state by applying external subliminal stimuli. In short, brainwave entrainment is accomplished by changing the brain's electrical field and this can be accomplished using external radio waves. The combination of varying rhythms of pulses of radio waves in an electromagnetic field can alter a biological being's mind subconsciously. By consciously controlling one's own electromagnetic field, one can expand one's electrical aura to influence metal objects magnetically or, even more drastically, this energy can be channeled into pyrokinesis, the ability to start fires using only one's mind. Part 6. Schumann Resonances The Schumann Resonances are a set of spectrum peaks in the extremely low frequency ELF portion of the Earth's electromagnetic field spectrum. Schumann Resonances are global electromagnetic resonances excited by lightning discharges in the cavity formed by the Earth's surface in the ionosphere. Schumann resonances occur because the space between the surface of the Earth and the conductive ionosphere acts as a resonant cavity for electromagnetic waves in the ELF band. The cavity is naturally excited by electric currents and lightning. At any given time, there are around 2,000 thunderstorms around the globe, producing around 50 lightning events per second. Lightning discharges are considered to be the primary natural source of Schumann resonance excitation because lightning channels behave like huge antennas that radiate electromagnetic energy at frequencies below about 100 kilohertz. These signals are very weak at large distances from the lightning source but the Earth Ionosphere Waveguide behaves like a resonator at ELF frequencies and amplifies the spectral signals from lightning at the resonance frequencies. In the normal mode descriptions of Schumann resonances, the fundamental mode is a standing wave in the Earth Ionosphere cavity with a wavelength equal to the circumference of the Earth. The resonant frequency of the Earth's ionosphere cavity is approximately 8 hertz. Schumann resonances are the principal background in the electromagnetic spectrum between 3 and 69 hertz and appear as distinct peaks at extremely low frequencies around 7.83, 14 14.3, 20.8, 27.3, and 33.8 hertz. The Schumann resonance electric field amplitude, around 300 microvolts per meter, is much smaller than the static fair weather electric field of around 150 volts per meter in the atmosphere. Similarly, the amplitude of the Schumann resonance magnetic field, around 1 picotesla, is many orders of magnitude smaller than the Earth magnetic field around 30 to 50 microteslas. This lowest frequency and highest intensity mode of the Schumann resonance occurs at a frequency of approximately 7.83 Hertz. The higher resonance modes are spaced at approximately 6.5 Hertz intervals. The peaks exhibit a spectral width of approximately 20% on account of the damping of the respective modes in the dissipative cavity. The eighth overtone, 
lies at approximately 59.9 Hz. The entire Schumann resonance spectrum occurs within the same range of radio wavelengths of the electromagnetic energy spectrum as ordinary brainwave states. Part 7. The Next Harp The Large Hadron Collider, LHC, is the world's largest and highest energy particle accelerator. The term hadron refers to particles composed of quarks. The LHC lies in a tunnel 27 kilometers, 17 miles, in circumference, as much as 175 meters, 574 feet, beneath the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva, Switzerland. This synchrotron is designed to collide opposing particle beams of either protons at an energy of 7 tera electron volts, 7 TeV or 1.12 microjoules per particle, or lead nuclei at an energy of 574 tera electron volts, 92.0 microjoules per nucleus. On the 10th of September 2008, the proton beams were successfully circulated in the main ring of the LHC for the first time, but nine days later operations were halted due to a serious fault. On 20 November 2009, they were successfully circulated again, with the first recorded proton-proton collisions occurring three days later at the injection energy of 450 giga electron volts per beam. After the 2009 winter shutdown, the LHC was restarted and the beam was ramped up to half power, 3.5 tera electron volts per beam, i.e. half its designed energy. On 30 March 2010, the first planned collisions took place between two 3.5 tera electron volt beams, a new world record for the highest energy man-made particle collisions. The LHC will continue to operate at half power for some years. It will not be capable of running at its design power of 7 tera electron volts until 2014. Although much touted for seeking to research the theoretical Higgs boson, the primary experiments performed first and so far only by the CERN LHC deal with creation of quark gluon plasma from acceleration of heavy ions. In the LHC heavy ion program three experiments ALICE, ATLAS, and CMS will aim beams of heavy nuclei ions to collide at energies more than 100,000 times the temperature at the center of the Sun reaching conditions that existed in the first microseconds after the Big Bang. The current theory of strong interactions, called quantum chromodynamics, predicts that at very high temperatures, quarks and gluons are deconfined and can exist freely in a new state of matter known as the quark-gluon plasma. Prior to the first activation of the CERN LHC, a safety report was commissioned to assess the potential dangers from such a line of experimentation. The following is an extended quote from this report filed by the LHC Safety Assessment Group, or LSAG. Quote, the controlled experimental conditions offered by accelerators permit the detailed study of many natural phenomena occurring in the universe. Many of the fundamental particles, such as muons, pions, and strange particles, were first discovered among the cosmic rays and were subsequently studied with accelerators. As the energies of accelerators have increased, they have also revealed many heavier and less stable particles, such as those containing heavier quarks, as well as the carrier particles of the weak interactions. Though not present in ordinary stable matter, these particles played important roles in the early history of the universe and may still be important today in energetic astronomical bodies such as those producing the cosmic rays. 
The LHC is designed to collide two counter-rotating beams of protons, or heavy ions. Proton-proton collisions are foreseen at an energy of 7 tera electron volts per beam. An equivalent energy in the center of mass would be obtained in the collision of a cosmic ray proton with a fixed target such as the Earth or some other astronomical body if its energy reaches or exceeds 108 giga electron volts, i.e. 10 to the 17th electron volts. When the LHC attains its design collision rate, it will produce about a billion proton-proton collisions per second in each of the major detectors ATLAS and CMS. The effective amount of time each year that the LHC will produce collisions at this average luminosity is about 10 million seconds. Hence, each of the two major detectors is expecting to obtain about 10 to the 17th proton-proton collisions over the planned duration of the experiments. The highest energy cosmic rays observed attain energies of around 10 to the 20th electron volts, and the total flux of cosmic rays with energies of 10 to the 17th electron volts or more that hit each square centimeter of the Earth's surface is measured to be about 5 times 10 to the negative 14th per second. The area of the Earth's surface is about 5 times 10 to the 18th square centimeters, and the age of the Earth is about 4.5 billion years. Therefore, over 3 times 10 to the 22nd cosmic rays with energies of 10 to the 17th electron volts or more, equal to or greater than the LHC energy, have struck the Earth's surface since its formation. This means that nature has already conducted the experiment of about 100,000 LHC experimental programs on Earth already, and the planet still exists. End quote. The LSAG report, as it was commissioned to do, found the LHC safe to operate prior to its first test on the grounds that, essentially, equivalent forms of exotic matter and relativistic particles even including antimatter that could only have existed under temperature conditions not present in the universe since just following the Big Bang, appear frequently in our own planet's uppermost atmosphere as it reacts to the interference on it by cosmic radiation. The exact type of reactions in the uppermost ionosphere they are comparing the LHC's collisions to are called ELVs, a rough acronym for emissions of light and very low frequency perturbations from electromagnetic pulse sources. Elves often appear as dim, flattened, expanding glows around 250 miles 402 kilometers in diameter that last for typically just one millisecond. They occur in the ionosphere 60 miles 97 kilometers above the ground over thunderstorms. Their color was a puzzle for some time, but it is now believed to be a red hue. The acronym ELVES refers to the process by which the light is generated, the excitation of nitrogen molecules due to electron collisions, the electrons possibly having been energized by the electromagnetic pulse caused by a discharge from the ionosphere. Natural lightning makes x-rays in large quantities. The cause of the X-ray emissions is still a matter for research, as the temperature of lightning is too low to account for the X-rays observed. A number of observations by space-based telescopes have revealed even higher energy gamma-ray emissions, and new challenges are posed to current theories of lightning formation by the recent discovery of antimatter positron signatures in these types of emissions. In other words, because elves are caused by cosmic radiation refracting in the ionosphere of Earth and last only one millisecond, and because lightning bolts have been found to emit large quantities of very low frequency X and gamma radiation, the CERN LHC is deemed a safe place to do socially useful work. Never mind the clear correlation implied between the reaction of lightning being caused by cosmic rays 
and the ability of ionospheric heaters to manipulate the altitude of the ionosphere. Nevertheless, what we seem to be seeing here amounts to a quite clearly very dangerous line of scientific reasoning. Although it may only last one millisecond, a bolt of lightning can easily combust a person to ash. Likewise, experiments harnessing temperatures equivalent to the core of our own star, the Sun, threaten to break free from the LHC circulating magnetically shielded ring array and cause mass destruction. Also, experiments using ionospheric heaters can definitely affect the Schumann resonance frequencies resulting from lightning storms within the ionosphere, and these same Schumann resonances play a very important part in the propagation of all Earth's living, biological, sentient beings' brain waves. The research being done by university and private sector professional scientists now conducted at facilities such as the CERN LHC and other weaker powered particle accelerators and at facilities such as HARP and other ionospheric heating facilities is dangerous and should stop. The assessment of the safety of such experiments depends on the premise that they are applying past forms of useful and safe methods in the same way merely to a new field of research and study. However another way to put it is that these scientists are playing God. The dangers and folly of such pursuits as weather modification, mind control, cold fission, and harnessing antimatter are apparent to all alive on earth besides those for whom military funding is now provided to build such useless pipe dreams, even if only to see their harmless inventions be immediately weaponized. Meanwhile, other experiments, such as this one involving a simple styrofoam ring, two magnets, and some dry ice that clearly display effects of anti-gravity levitation, are either suppressed or ignored in the mainstream of scientific research. The hunt for ZPE is seen as a quixotic quest only because the same research scientists who man these machines nowadays assume that such technologies have already long ago been perfected in secret by their shadowy military masters. The experiments proving anti-gravity effects can be accomplished by any of a variety of ways, are relegated thus to only a few very ingenuitive engineers' garage laboratories. Here we see the unpredictable effects on various forms of matter accomplished by inventor John Hutchinson by directing high amp electromagnets onto a small test area. Part 8. The Choir In conclusion, allow me to present the argument that any scientific experiment that could result in massive damage to the planetary ecosphere or result in the loss of hundreds, thousands, millions, or even billions of human lives should not be pursued. To honor nature, the operative god of science, we should not attempt to harness and control it, nor force it to do our bidding. This will only result in human downfall and the destruction of all we would seek to build. Last, I shall leave you with the sounds of Earth's natural Schumann resonance frequency around 8 Hz, followed by a short sample of the woodpecker signal that was continually broadcast globally by the Soviet Duga antenna array, and lastly you shall hear the sound produced by a firing of the harp antenna array. Please use these moments to consider your role in the world, and to choose whether you are on the side of nature or of militant scientific progress. Thank you for your time. Peace. John.